and camera off.
We're live. Yeah. Just get this. Okay. Check the chat, says eight people on. We are not techies. <laughs> Testing the sound. Can you all hear us? Yes. 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 Sound is on. All right. Good start. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see everybody bright and early on a Sunday morning. As everybody Zach said last night, at this point in our program, it's a little bit redundant to be introducing our scholars and residents. But Dr. Levine played an important role actually in my development. I don't know how much she knows about this, but when I was in NYU, I studied psychology as my major and I minored in Jewish philosophy. And during Smitha, I went to Revel and I had a choice. My choice was between Jewish philosophy, continuing in that path, or switching to Jewish history. And frankly, the decision was based off of two things that I chose medieval Jewish history. Number one was taking Dr. Levine's class. And number two was the department in medieval Jewish history in Revel was particularly strong. And so that combination of factors uh, pushed me in that direction. And anybody who knows me and uh, my style of shiurim and whatnot knows how much I draw from my background in medieval Jewish history in terms of who the Rishonim were, where they come from, how that affected who they are. And a part of that is due to Dr. Levine. So it is my honor to welcome again. Thank you, Rabbi Newman, for your generous and kind words and for your warm welcome, and really to, the, to this community for your warm and wonderful welcome um, this Shabbat to both of us, especially thank you, Ekmans, for your uh, gracious hospitality. Um, 
And it's always, and we were just talking, it's always so nice for me to come to Columbus. I have very fond memories um, of spending time here in the summer visiting my grandparents. I feel um, connected to this community. Um, it's especially nice that this is the place where we're sort of ending the pandemic that is coming out, you know, traveling again. This is the first time I've gotten on a plane, you know, since March of 2020, like many of us. And, and this has been such a beautiful, beautiful experience and such, um, so thank you. Um, so nice to learn together with um, and from, from this community and to be reminded that there is in fact like beautiful Jewish life outside of Tina um, and outside of, of the New York area. This morning, I'd like to think about um, a medieval Jewish fantasy. Um, one, of the things, and this we talked about this yesterday, that the hardest thing for Jews in the Middle Ages was a Christian argument that said that Jewish status in the world, Jewish lack of sovereignty, the fact that Jews are dispersed and that others rule over them is in and of itself evidence that God has rejected the Jewish people. And I for Jews in the Middle Ages, it wasn't just because it was a Christian claim, but this exile stretched on and on and on. And at some point, I think Jews started asking themselves, maybe it really is true. That is, this is a Christian argument that really hits Jews where they live, and Jews have to figure out how to really how to respond to that, not to have something to say to Christians, but to have something to say to themselves. And, and so one of the things that they did was they hit on the idea of 10 tribes who exist somewhere out there. We know about the 10 tribes. The, ten, the story of the 10 tribes is told in Tanakh that the king of Assyr Assyria captured uh, Shomron, and he deported the 10 tribes to Assyria. And he, he settles them in Halach Nahar Chabor at the river Gulzan in the towns of Media because they sinned, right? And so this is the story of the exile of the 10 tribes. And one question that occupies, even comes to preoccupy a Jewish imagination and as we'll see a Christian imagination as well is the question of what happens to these 10 lost tribes. The Mishnah in Sanhedrin posits, Aser Hashbatim Einan Atidim Asor. The 10 tribes are not coming back, right? The Pasuk in Zivarim says, Bayashichem El Eretz Acher Kayom Hazeh, right? The, to cast them into to another land as to this day, Kayom Hazeh, right? Just like Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, the optimist Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, who, the Gemara at the end of Makro, so Kabanat said, Wunay Sassiyam, ever, this is the one he's doing. At the end of Makro, he talks about seeing a fox in the ruins of the Beit Hamikdash, and he laughs, and he says, if the prophecy, of boxes going through the ruins of the Beit HaMikdash is fulfilled, then I believe also that this is evidence that the prophecy that there will be song and dance and joyousness and weddings in the streets of Jerusalem, that will also be fulfilled. Rabbi Akiva the Optimist says, just like a day, right, Kayom Hazed, just like a day, once it's done, it is done. It's not coming back. These 12 tribes are not coming back. Rabbi Lezer has a different opinion. He says, like this day is cloudy, um, but then lights up again. The 10 tribes, which are shrouded in darkness now, they will return. Um, but it's interesting that Rabbi Akiva, who's really a, a more prominent uh, Tana, says that they're not coming back. And then Rishani wonders, where did they go? Um, Rabbi Brecha and Rabbi Chalbo say that they went into exile in three divisions. One went to the other side of the Sambachim. The Sambachim 
is a legendary river, right? It doesn't exist. It's the, it's the river that rests on Shabbat, right? So according to the, to the legend, the Sambat Yom is a river that throws up rocks and dirt all week so that it is impassable. But on Shabbat, the river Sambat Yom rests. Where the Sambat Yom is located in, in the Jewish imagination shifts with the expanding boundaries of the known world. That is the Sambat Yom is just on the other side of the world that we know of the world which is familiar. Another group went to Daphne and Antioch and a third was covered by a cloud which came upon them, right? So they, had, they imagined that they went to these three different places. The, in, in Tehillim, right, that, that imagines what happens to the exiles, this is the exiles of Yehuda when they are exiled, um, the, the psalm imagines that they just, right, and when they were told, their captors mocked them and said to them, sing to us from the song of Zion. And they said, how can we sing the, sing of, the song of God on foreign land? And the Midrash picks up on this. It says, they didn't say we won't sing. They said, how can we sing? We can't. And the Midrash imagines that the Levine cut off their thumbs so that they would not be able to play their musical instruments, right? In this, right, for the, for the entertainment of their captors, right? And, and then the Midrash imagines that they were immediately and miraculously taken up and transported to the land of the B'nai Moshe, their Levian, where they were protected um, as a reward for refusing to play for their captors. So the Midrash, and, and this, this, uh, these B'nai Moshe were taken to the other side of the Sambachon. So where the Sambachon is, the, it's a, it's a, of an imaginary river, but it plays a, a tremendous role in the Jewish imagination. Not too much is said about the 10 lost tribes until in the ninth century, a man appears in Babylonia. He introduces himself as Eldad Hadani. Eldad, a traveler who comes from the tribe of Dan, who describes a great adventure that he had um, where he was shipwrecked and taken captive, but he comes and he says, I come from the other side of the river Sambatio and I come bringing news of Shebet, of this, this tribe of the 10 lost tribes. And he says in the first source under heading two, he says, a Jew, a merchant of the tribe of Yisachar found me, and bought me for 32 gold pieces and brought me back with him to his country. They live in the mountains of the sea coast and belong to the lands of the Medes and the Persians. They fulfill the command, right? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And there is no yoke of sovereignty upon them except the yoke of Torah. That is, these are Jews who are not subjugated, he says. They're, I come from a, from a group of people where the, ten, where the 10 tribes are, and there Jews have kingship. He says, the name of the tribes of Dan, Naftali, Gad, and Asher is Uziel. The name of the great prince is Elis Tafan of the sons of Aholiab of the tribe of Dan. And they have a flag, it's white and written in black, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echa. And he draws on this midrash about the B'nai Moshe. And he tells them that the B'nai Moshe don't see anyone and no one sees them except for these four tribes because they live on the other side of the river in Ethiopia. There's a place where they can see each other and speak if they cry out, but the river Sambachon is between them. The river runs and the stones and sand grumble during the six days of the week, but on the seventh day it rests and is tranquil until the end of Shabbat. And people didn't know what to make of this person. 
the question that historians ask is, is he who he purports to be? And the answer is, of course, he is not who he purports to be. There is, this is a legendary kingdom, right? He is a, he's an adventurer. He is, he's telling a fantastical story. Um, and people have two concerns. On the one hand, right, he's coming to Babylonia in the ninth century. This is a moment where there is a Karaite challenge to rabbinic Judaism. The Karaites say that they follow, that there is no oral tradition. There is no oral law. They say that the only authoritative source is the Torah, the written scripture, and the oral that every every man should interpret for himself. And the oral law and the rabbis are not authoritative. Rather, the rabbis lead people astray. And so one concern is, is this guy to be anachronistic? Is he orthodox? Or is he Karaite? After all, he also doesn't have familiarity with the Torah of al with the oral law. So maybe he is heterodox and we need to be concerned about him for that reason. And they say, no, there's a difference between rejecting the oral law and having been cut off from the Jewish people before the full development of the oral law. So these are not people who reject the oral law. So they are okay. But the idea that there is somewhere in this world, a group of people who don't answer to any other authority, who are not subject to rulers of another faith, sparks the Jewish imagination. And in the Middle Ages, it's just the very idea that these people exist. This is the reason, by the way, that the Khazars are so exciting to Jews in the Middle Ages. Chassai ibn Shafrut, courtier at the court of Abd al-Rahman III in Andalusia and Cordoba in the 10th century, he hears from travelers that there is an independent Jewish kingdom of the Khazars, where the Khazars converted to Judaism. Uh, and he says, is it true? And they say, yes. And so he says, I'm going to write to Joseph, the king of the Khazars. And he writes to him and he says, is it true that you really are Jewish kings? And he writes back and they say, yes, we are. And he says to him, he writes him a whole bunch of things and this is how we found out about you when we sent, they sent gifts and this and that. And perhaps you can tell me when the Messiah is due to arrive. Because the idea that Jewish sovereignty exists in the world is a harbinger of messianic hope. If there is one verse that could be said to be ground zero for the Jewish Christian debate in the Middle Ages, it is the Pasuk in Reshit Namtet Yud, in Birchot Yaakov, in Yaakov's blessings to his children, right? He says to Judah, Lo Yasur Shevet Yehuda, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, Lo Mechokek Mi Ben Raglad, nor the, uh, the, the scepter or the staff from between his feet, referring to kingship, Ad Ki Yavo Shilo, Velo Yikat Ami. Ad Ki Yavo Shilo, um, something about coming and Shilo, leave it untranslated for the moment, and then unto him there will be a gathering of nations. Um, Christians understand this to mean Ad Ki Yavo Shilo until Shilo comes. Shilo being the Messiah, being Jesus, will love Yikat Amim, and unto him there will be a gathering of nations. That means Yaakov's blessing is read to say that there will be sovereignty to the Jewish people until the Mashiach comes. And then Judah will no longer have sovereignty. And Christians point to this verse and they say, aha, you see that the Jewish loss of sovereignty was coterminous with the coming of Jesus. This is evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jewish polemicists, anti-Christian polemicists, twist themselves into pretzels to try to figure out how to respond to this claim. Um, and it's especially hard because the Midrash reads Ad Kiyavo Shilo, until the Mashiach comes, right? Shilo being Zesha HaShalom Shalom. It's a reading that is very, um, lends itself, is very aligned with that Christian interpretation. And so Rashbam of Hashtan says Ad Kiyavo Shilo doesn't mean until Shilo comes, but rather he, until he comes to Shilo. And he says, when was this prophecy fulfilled? This prophecy was fulfilled at the time when the 10 kingdoms 
split off, then you don't have Judean sovereignty. He said this took place in Shem, and Shem is like Shiloh. In other words, the Christian claim is nothing here. This took place in Malachi. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. Another thing that Jewish Christian polemic, Jewish polemicists say is, well, actually, there still is Jewish sovereignty of a sort because Jewish communal authorities have a certain amount of sovereignty. Another way that they say it is, well, it's true that Jews lost sovereignty, but Jews lost sovereignty well before the time of Jesus. Um, and so this can't possibly be evidence that Jesus is a Mashiach. This question of Jewish sovereignty or lack thereof is a key issue for Jews and Christians in the Middle Ages. And so when al Hadani comes and says to them, there's a Jewish kingdom and they don't have the yoke of sovereignty, only the yoke of Torah, this is cause for tremendous celebration and great hope. Benjamin of Tudela is a 12th century Jewish traveler. We really know very, very little about him. <laughs> um, some have suggested that one of the things that he's doing is he sees that Jewish life for Jews in Christian Spain is becoming increasingly difficult and part of his objective was to see, is there another place that's ripe for Jewish settlement? Um, when he goes to Rome, he talks about going to the Fourth Lateran Church, where he says, he says that in the basement of this church, they have the pillars, Yachin and Boaz. Um, he says, and on Tisha B'Av, the, these pillars weep, uh, Benjamin Tudela says. When he goes to Baghdad and he sees the court of the Exilarch, right, the Jewish leader of the exile, who is the, uh, the leader of the Jewish community and sort of the foreign minister, so to speak, of the Jewish community, the liaison between the Muslim caliph and the Jewish community. He describes him in royal terms. He says he sits on this throne that's opposite the caliph um, and the caliph gives him respect and all of these Muslims bow down to him. Um, and he has a, a silver amulet that, that mo fulfills the word of Muhammad because Muhammad says that he should have this role. And as a historian, you think, wait a second, this is not what was happening in Baghdad. There was an XLR, and he did have some authority, but this is not it. Um, what's going on here? And Benjamin of Tudela completely shows his hand. He says, no, and all of this fulfills the Pasukul. This is, he says, a Jewish king in Baghdad. Again, we are looking for sovereignty wherever we can find it, including in our imagination because he describes there are men of Israel in the land of Persia, but he doesn't say he goes there, but he describes hearing about them, who say that in the mountains of Nisabur, four of the tribes of Israel dwell, namely the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Asher, and the tribe of Naphtali, who were included in the first ca uh, captivity of Shalmaneser, not the king of Ashur. As it is written in Malachi, Bet, he put them in Chalach and Chagor by, uh, by the river of Gozan and in the city of the Medes. He says, the extent of their land is 20 days journey. They have cities, large villages in the mountains. The river Gozan is the boundary on the one side. They are not under the rule of Gentiles. They have a prince of their own whose name is Rabbi Yosef the prince, who is a levy. There are scholars among them and they sow and reap and go forth to war as far as the land of Cush by way of the desert. Right? This is a fantasy of Jews who are independent, sovereign, carry weapons. They're not warrior-like, right? they don't seek war, but they do carry weapons and they are able to protect themselves. Just the existence of, of, of this idea gives hope to Jews in the Middle Ages. Um, and Christians really can't stand the idea that Jews have a concept that somewhere in the world, there is Jewish sovereignty. And so they come up with a counter story of Prester John, who is a Christian king to whom this, these Jewish kings offer tribute. Right? Because it has to be that Jews are not sovereign from a Christian theological perspective. Do you know what the Vatican recognized the state of Israel? What's that? 1990 something. 
right? And part of the reason, a big piece of the reason that it took such a long time. I mean, today we would think, oh, they're worried about the Palestinians and what's the relationship with Palestinians. It's not it. It's a Christian theological issue, right? The idea that there, there is Jewish sovereignty in the world and especially Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel is challenging to some deeply held Christian theological principles. And so recognizing Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel by means of the state of Israel is something that requires something of a theological reckoning and rethinking. And so it took Vatican, the Vatican a long time to recognize and come to terms with the existence of the state of Israel. Christians in the Middle Ages couldn't even get that far. So they imagine Prester John and write, in our country is a river full of stones which falls into the ocean, which flows between the sea and the nine tribes of Israel. Again, this is the Sambation. This river runs all week until the Shabbat day when it rests. It carries large and small stones to the sea like a river of water does. Consequently, the nine tribes of Israel cannot pass the river. We make known to you that for expenses which we are obliged to make for the great king of Israel, he gives us yearly a hundred camels loaded with gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. Besides this, he pays a tribute for our not ravaging the land which lies between us and themselves. In other words, the Christians come up with a counter fantasy to challenge the Jewish fantasy of sovereignty. To give you a sense of how, <laughs> how meaningful this question of Jewish sovereignty is, um, we have a letter written by Yehoshua Halorki, a student of Rabbi Shlomo Halevi. In Spain in the year 1391, there was an outbreak of anti-Jewish rioting um, in Spain, beginning in Castile, spreading through Aragon, um, and when part of the reason that it happens is the forces that tend to protect Jews, that is royal authority or ecclesiastical hierarchy, a bishop as opposed to, thank you very much, a bishop as opposed to say a local preacher, both of those were, uh, the, bishop, the archbishop died, the king died, meant open season on Jews and it spread like wildfire. If you're familiar with the history of conversos, the Spanish experience of conversos, or it was often termed Marranos, 1391 is the moment where this begins. Um, Casay Crescas reports that in 1391, a third of the Jewish community, about 100,000 people were killed. A third of the Jewish community managed to save themselves somehow. And approximately a third of the Jewish community, that is 100,000 people, converted to Christianity. From all walks of life, um, including a rabbi, although some have suggested that he converted in 1390, that is that his was a volitional conversion, not a forced conversion. But think about the poor student of this rabbi who converted to Christianity. He, he's just in a tailspin, right? What do you do when you're, when you're rabbi becomes a Christian. And so he writes to him and he tries to figure out what he says, I, I, I want to I learn from you. I want to teach me. Help me understand. I heard that you did this. Tell me what was going on with you. And he says, I can imagine four possibilities. And these four possibilities are fascinating because they illuminate how someone thinks about a person who chooses to convert to Christianity. What are the, what's the range of possible motivations? This is the first thing that occurs to me is that maybe you had appetites, you wanted to do things to indulge in pleasures that were prohibited to you as a Jew. Now, of course, this is a very convenient thing to say. It's not super respectful to the person who's converting, but it is very comforting to the people who are, who are Jewish to say, there's nothing attractive beyond pleasure. And he says, but I know you, you were my teacher. I don't, I don't think this is what drives you. Maybe some people, but not you. And he says, the second possibility is the study of philosophy. Maybe the truth of the matter is that you are a philosopher. You are neither a believer in Judaism nor a believer in Christianity, but why not be, why not nominally subscribe to a religion that lets you sleep safely at night than one 
that does it. And this is, this is something that both Shlomo Alami and his Igarat Musar, mystically inclined preacher, he indicts Spanish Jewry for being infected by philosophy and says, this is why so many of you converted when confronted to the truth. And the great German Jewish historian of Spanish Jewry, Yitzhak Baer, reaches a similar conclusion, that it is the inclination toward philosophy that leads Spanish Jewry to not be able to hold on to their religious faith. But Yehoshua Halorki, the student says, no, I don't think that that's what led you. He says, I think that you knew how to eat the fruit and discard the rind when it comes to philosophy. Right? This is the rabbinic idiom for taking what is valuable for philosophical study. And it's really a model for interacting with any kind of general of, of outside culture, which is to take the fruit, take that, that which is valuable, but understand that there is a rind which must be discarded. So I don't know, I think that that's what's going on with you. He says, but here's another possibility. Maybe when you observe the destruction of our homeland and the many troubles that have recently befallen us, consuming us and scattering us, and that God has almost hidden his countenance from us and made us as food to the birds and the of the heaven and the wild beasts of the earth, it occurred to you that God forbid, shame Yisrael lo yizacher, oh, the name of Israel will not be remembered anymore. He says, maybe it's the argument from history. This is that Christian argument that the Jewish situation in the world is in fact evidence that God has abandoned the Jewish people. And he says, I cannot argue that the third reason that is the destruction of the people may have deluded you because I am confident that you are not ignorant of the fact that is well known amongst us, that first of all, at present, most of our people are to be found in the lands of Babylonia and Yemen, where the exiles of Jerusalem settled at first. In other words, the vast majority of the Jewish population is in the Muslim world. Jews in the Christian world are a small percentage. They don't represent the entirety of the picture. He says, besides the exiles of Samaria, the 10 tribes, who today are as numerous as the sands on the seashore who dwell in the lands of Persia and Medea. Some of these exiles live under the domination of a king who is called the Sultan of Babylon and the Ishmaelites. Some in districts where the yoke of no other people is upon them, such as those who live on the border of the lands of the Cushites, near the Edomite prince, the Christian prince called Prester John, who have a treaty with him that is renewed annually. And that is an irrefutable fact. And he says, following this assumption, even if it were God's decree to destroy and exterminate all the Jews who live within Christendom, the people would remain alive and intact. So this should not lead to a weakening of faith. He says, you know better than to be drawn in by the Christian argument from history because you have more evidence. Among the evidence that you have is the existence of Jews in the Muslim world, where according to Benjamin Chazal, they have their own king, Isaiah. And he says, you also know about the kingdom of the 10 lost tribes, where they have, some of them offer tribute and some of them have no yoke upon them. He says, so there's no way that you would be um, sucked in by that Christian argument because you know the irrefutable fact that there is Jewish sovereignty in the world. So Yahushua Halorki concludes that his teacher must have been persuaded by the Christian claim that Jesus does in fact represent the bearer of a new covenant, which of course, if you think about sort of how to understand people's religious changes, in a way, this is the one that gives the most credence and respect to thinking about how a person makes choices. It's also, of course, the most challenging one for a student to come to. Um, Shlomo Halevi interestingly responds and he says, I don't have a lot of time to write back to you, but yes, this is true. And I used to be a levy as, um, as a Jew, and now I am becoming a true priest as a Christian. Raise your hand if you're surprised to learn that Yehoshua Halorki himself converted not that long thereafter. But Yehoshua Halorki says, on the one hand, you might be persuaded by this Christian claim. On the other hand, he says, you know better because you know of the existence of this sovereign Jewish tribe, so you're not sucked into that. That can't possibly be what led you to convert. Maybe somebody else. But as the Middle Ages comes to a close, 
travel to the land of Israel, pilgrimage to the land of Israel becomes more common. Rabbi Ovadia of Barchinura travels to the land of Israel. Um, one thing that's interesting is that his travel accounts, he, has, he, he comes, comes from Italy, he comes from, from Christian lands, and he has very negative things to say about Jews in the Muslim world. He says, I mean, they, they offer him hospitality, and yet he says, they sit on the floor, they don't have chairs, they eat with their hands, they don't have utensils. And another, another Jewish traveler from Italy, Michel of Volterra, writes, writes a little bit later, and he describes the hospitality. You can feel, you can almost feel the implicit rebuke that says these are people who welcomed you graciously. Um, how, are, how are you portraying them in such makes that they're like animals? They don't, they don't eat with forks and knives. They're not animals, they just live in the Muslim world. That's how they do things there. Um, another interesting thing that is very um, that jumps out at travelers from the Christian world when they go to the Muslim world is the absence of women in public spaces. Um, that is something that they notice a lot. Jewish communities in the Muslim world, um, like the Muslim world in general, keep women behind curtains, um, literally. So um, it, is, it is Benjamin of Tudela who actually describes, I don't know if you're familiar with the source of the famous, um, the daughter of the Rosh Shiva in, in Baghdad who taught from behind a curtain. Um, it's one of these medieval European Jewish travelers. It was very striking, very striking to her. So Ovadia of Barchinura talks about coming to the land of Israel. He talks about, and these travelers are fascinating. They go to the Dead Sea and they're looking for, from yesterday's parsha, they're looking for the pillar of salt that is Lot's wife. And some of them say, oh, I went to the Dead Sea and I saw it, there it was. And some of them come and say, I looked and looked and looked. I can't find it anywhere. I don't know what they're talking about. So, you know, if you, if you want to see it, it would seem that, that it is there to see. And he talks, he talks about not being able to get into the Ma'arat HaMachpila unless he disguises himself because entrance into Ma'arat HaMachpila is prohibited to Jews. And then he talks about going to the hotel and he talks about how dejected he is, right? At seeing that this is a Muslim holy place, right? And this for him, to go to the Kotel today is one thing, it's a beautiful plaza, right? To go, for Jews to go to the Kotel in the medieval and early modern period is, is really, they, they don't call it the Wailing Wall for nothing, right? For them, it's a, it's a site that reminds them of the state of the, of the destruction. And he's sitting there contemplating the low state of Harabayat, of the Beit HaMadash, of the Jewish people. And he says at that point in his account, I made inquiries concerning Sambachion. He says, just when I'm at the nadir of thinking about Jewish status in the world, what it means, what has happened to Judaism, I thought about the Sambachion. He says, I have no clear information just per se, but one thing I know without doubt. In one of the borders of the kingdom of Pastor John, there are high mountains and valleys that can be traversed in 10 days journey, which are certainly inhabited by the descendants of Israel. They have five princes or kings, and people say that they carried on great wars against the Prester John for more than a century. And then later in his account, he relates from a conversation with Yemeni Jews. It is what now well known through reliable Ishmaelite merchants that the river Sambacho is 50 days journey from them in the wilderness, and like a thread surrounds the whole land where the children of Israel dwell. It throws stones and sand on weekdays and only rests on Shabbat. This means that no Jew can go to that land lest he desecrate the Shabbat. Because you can't cross the river during the week because it's impassable and you can't cross the river on Shabbat because you can't go past the truck. So the, this means that, no, that these children of Israel have a tradition that they are all B'nai Moshe, they are all descendants of Moshe, who were magically transported, pure and clean as the ministering angels. So until the end of the 15th century, just the idea of the existence of a sovereign Jewish kingdom in the lands of the Ten Walls tribes, somewhere on the other side of the river Sambacho, wherever that may be, is enough to give strength and comfort and encouragement to Jews. The situation for Jews deteriorates in the early modern period. Uh, 
Salo Barun, the great American historian of the medieval Jewish experience, makes a counterintuitive argument that the Middle Ages was actually more stable for Jews than the early modern and the modern period was. Um, and if you think about this, this legend of the Tamworth tribe, you'll see that it grows and develops as Jews feel increasingly threatened. One of the things that happens in Spain, for example, is the creation of a, group, of a large converso community. And there's this sense of what is going to be with these Jews who have converted to Christianity and their descendants who are not really being assimilated into Christian culture. We don't really know what the religious identity of the majority of these Jews are. Um, some historians like Benzio Netanyahu argued that they actually wanted to go along and get along to get along and become Christian. And it was only when the church, when the church and really Sp Spanish Christians refused to accept them, creating laws about conversos and the things that they weren't allowed to do, like hold high public office or occupy positions of power that sounded an awful lot like the restrictions um, to which they were limited when they were Jews, um, that they realized that they needed to turn to Judaism and become crypto Jews. Other historians like Rene Levy Malamed are more trusting of the inquisitional sources that describe crypto Jewish rituals but there is this question in the middle of the 16th century, what is going to be? And so you have a, an adventurer who styles himself, David Ruveni, um, who says that he is the brother of King Joseph of Havor. And he and Shlomo Malcho, his, um, his, his partner in crime or in adventure, are going to, they, they try to create an alliance between this Jewish king of the Temloth tribes, King Joseph of Havor, the king of Portugal and the Pope, that they are going to put together a set of armies and they're going to go conquer the land of Israel from Muslims and they are going to rescue the conversos. They are going to take the conversos from their place in Spain and bring them to the land of Israel. So it's no longer talking, we're no longer thinking about the existence of the Ten Moth tribes as a source of comfort to Jews, but rather you know, the Telos tribes are like the cavalry that's going to come riding in and rescue Jews in their time of trouble. Rabbi Zach, does, uh, does this show recite Atamot on, on uh, Shavuot? So you think to Shavuot if you're awake for that part of the Shiva <laughs> on Shavuot. We no. have a practice, many shows have a practice of reciting an Aramaic piyot um, at, at uh, Kriyat HaTorah. And the truth is that it used to be that there was quite a bit of Aramaic peel, but this was standard part of the liturgy. It's fallen out. And the reason that it's fallen out is self-evident almost. Nobody understands it. It's impenetrable. And the real question almost is, is why is Akdamot still part of the liturgy? Why hasn't it fallen out as well? And there's certain, you know, there's uh, a lot of questions that whether it's permissible to interrupt Kriyat HaTorah for this, some communities recite it before the beginning of Kriyat HaTorah. But one, one suggestion have been, has been that it's not the Pia itself that leads it to be included, but rather the legend surrounding the Pia. And the legend surrounding the Pia describes the situation of a Jewish community in the Rhineland. The first recorded telling of this is in the 17th century, but it is set kind of in the period of the Crusades. And according to this legend, there is a sorcerer who is using his magic to kill Jews. And Jews are falling like flies. And so Jews do what they do in the Middle Ages, which is they seek royal protection. So the Jewish community of worms, they go to the king who summons the monk and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll stop my attack on Jews for one year. But at the end of a year, we're going to have a contest. The Jews have to produce their guy. I'll be there and we're gonna have a magic competition. And if they win, like this is like a sorcery duel. If the Jew guy, Jewish guy wins, then I'll stop attacking them. And if he loses, then I'm gonna kill them all. So you can imagine, can you imagine the feeling in worms at the time, at this, right? It, as portrayed by the legend. And they're thinking, they're thinking, they're thinking, they don't have anybody to turn to. 
what are they going to do? Until the Meir Shliach Tzibur says, and, and in Ashkenaz, uh, they haven't realized that communities need rabbis to lead communities, to do more than to ask halakhic questions. They need to shape communities. So you don't have a professional rabbinate, but the fu religious functionary is the Shliach Tzibur. Right, the religious function, the Shliach Tzibur is the person who is not just leads the congregation in Tila, but he is the conduit of Tila. And a, a scholar in the community has a dream that they should go find someone among the 10 lost tribes who can save them. And Rav Meir Shliach Tzibur says, I will go. And so he travels and travels and travels. And he waits till Shabbat. And then he crosses the Sambachim because this is a case of Pekalach And he finds this character named Don, who, according to this legend, who is the most unlikely looking champion you could ever imagine. He's lame, he limps, and he sends him across the river on Shabbat. But Rabbi Meir Shliach Sibor, his mission is finished. So he can't cross back over to Sambacha. So he stays on the other side of the Sambacha River and he sends this piot of Akdamot and he says, take this back and this is how you should remember. This is how, he says, I'm going to give up my life, my family, my community, my connections to save the Jewish people, but I want to be remembered. And that is the, the acrostic of Akdamot. And some have suggested that it is this story and this idea that Rabbi Meir um, gave his life was Moser Nefesh for the Jewish community to get this savior from the tribe of Dan, right? This guy Dan from the 10 lost tribes. So again, here we have Jews in Europe, like have a, they have this the catastrophe, they are in danger. Who's going to come rescue them? From the people from the 10 lost tribes are going to come and save Jews from the distress in which they find themselves. One of the phenomena that develops in the 16th century um, is that you have much more travel literature. Europeans become very interested in people around the world, people around them. You get these kind of ethnographies um, and converts to Judaism, from Judaism, sorry, apostates, start writing about the Jewish community, which is really a foreign kind of community in the midst of Jews. And some of them, and th these are polemical ethnographies, right? So they don't have, um, they describe Jewish life, but in negative terms. So for example, they say, why is it that Jews and Christian, Jews sit separately in the synagogue, men and women, whereas Christians sit next? Because Jews are steeped in carnality, right? This is a, this is a Christian trope, that Jews are steeped in the carnal, whereas Christians are related to the spirit, right? Jews adhere to the to the, to the letter of the law, Christians adhere to the spirit of the law. And he says they're so licentious that if you had mixing in the pews, then you have no idea what would be happening during the service. That's why they have to sit separate. So it's true that Jewish men and women do sit separate during tefillah, right? That, that's, that, that is accurate. The rationale behind it is not, an, is, is not accurate. So that's like a po polemical ethnography. But one of the questions that Antonis Margarita, it rattles, people say, and how is it that Jews, given, given everything, how do they remain Jewish? What gives them the strength and the commitment to adhere to their, what Christians say is a false religion? Um, and he offers a number of reasons, including the fact that they are able to do business with Gentiles and they lend money to them at interest and they become affluent and kings give them privileges. And some have suggested that Martin Luther, at the one of the conundrums about Martin Luther and, and, the, and the Protestant Reformation is that at the beginning of his career, Martin Luther speaks more positively about Jews, but he ultimately treats Jews in very harsh ways. And some have suggested that it's the writings of this Antonius Margarita who say that what, um, what leads Jews to persevere in their obstinacy is the fact that Christians treat them reasonably well. And Martin Luther sees this and says, well, okay, so we have to change that policy. Um, among the things that they say, how do they comfort themselves? Among the things that they comfort themselves with is the promise in the Tochacha, right? It doesn't matter 
what happens to you, God says, I will not abandon you. They remind themselves. Um, Margarita describes this as the golden often. He says it's a golden ache, right? And often it's the af, but also the ache. Um, so again, a polemical ethnography, but this promise means a great deal to Jews. And he says also, they comfort themselves greatly with the 10 tribes that the king of Assyria drove out and led back to Assyria. It is a great wonder to me why they hope these 10 tribes will come and redeem them. They also write about a stream named Sambachon, which is so wild and wave tossed during the week that no one can cross it. Only on the Shabbat is the water calm. And when God wants to redeem the Jews here in this land, he will make the stream still and at rest. So for Margarita, on the list of things that causes, you know, choose your language, um, causes Jews to persevere in their obstinacy or enables them to retain their faith is this belief that there are not, not only that there is a kingdom of the 10 lost tribes, but that they will come riding in to rescue them. This legend of the 10 lost tribes is not purely academic. Um, when the apostate Jew, Henry Aaron Stern, went to Ethiopia, um, as part of the mission of the London Jewish Society, he was interested not in converting Africans, but in converting Jews. And he encountered the Beta Israel um, in Ethiopia. And he looks at them and he sees that they have these Judaic, these biblical practices. And he says, you know, it's clear to me that these people are Jewish, right? He, and he says, he says, you can just look at them and you look, they look just like the Jews on the East streets of the East End, of London. Again, one can see what everyone is trying to see. Just look at their faces, you can see it. They're, they're exactly the same. And he said, he, he, he wants to convert them to Christianity, but he is actually the first person to say that the Beta Israel to connect them to the larger world Jewry. And in discussing the status, the Jewish status of the Beta Israel, um, for, who, who ultimately come to Israel from Ethiopia, there was a big debate about whether they required conversion or not. And um, Rav Ovadia Yosef determined that they were Jewish, but it's fascinating to think about the basis of his determination. He writes, he draws on the early modern writings of the Egyptian rabbi, the Radbaz, who encounters by right, people who come from Ethiopia who say that they are Jewish. And he says, oh, yes, they are Jewish. These people, they're the descendants of Sheba Dan. No, they don't have, they don't have the Talmud. They just have the Torah Shabbat But they're the descendants of Sheba Dan. And we know that. And we know about them from Eldad Hadan. Right? And he says, um, the same thing that the Babylonian Gaon said. They didn't have the Talmud, so they only use scripture. That's what the Rabbaz says. And he bases his claim, the Rabbaz bases his claim that these people are descendants of Shevetan on, on, on what text, on what source? Our erstwhile trav, ninth century traveler, Eldad Hadani. Right, so as a historian, if Eldad Hadani doesn't exist, right, and if, is, is, if, there, if there is no kingdom of the Temple tribe, if there is no descendants of Shevetan, then it's fascinating that he says, um, that Rabbi says, no. Right? He says, we can trust that they are of Jewish descent because they come from the tribe of Dan, and we know this, um, which, which is fascinating. Um, and Professor David Berger, one of my teachers at Revel, I think I'm probably not the only one in the room who has studied with Professor Berger. Um, he's written quite poignantly about this question of the status of Ethiopian Jews of the Beta Israel. And he said, you know, my heart and my head are at war because my head understands that the halachic basis for this, which is a, is a historical claim, that is a historical claim 
that is not accurate, but my heart wants to embrace um, this, this community as a Jewish community. And it may be that Kali Israel can decide that a community is, is Jewish, and, and that's it. That, that's a decision of Kali Israel. But it's fascinating that this ninth century Jewish traveler and his fantasy have repercussions, not just in the Middle Ages, but also today for real questions of immigration to the state of Israel. And here I want to think about how fortunate we are to, to live in a time when the state of Israel exists and how how Jews, how we move differently in the world, right? In a pre-modern context, if Jews wanted to think about Jews being strong, Jews having power, you have two choices, right? Who, who can little Jews, Jewish boys play? Um, you can either play Maccabees, right? And the YU sports teams are the Maccabees and the JCCs, when they have a Jewish Olympics, it's the Maccabea, right? it's pretty much the only, the only thing. Or you can play Chemosh tribes. Right, or you can be warriors from the 10 lost tribes, but there's nothing, nothing in the Eastern European Jewish imagined experience that gives you, that creates that possibility. Today, um, I don't know if, how many of you share my experience, you have little boys, they dress up as Israeli soldiers for her, right? And when Jews are in distress throughout the world, it is the Israeli army, right? Israel protects Jews. It's not that people from the 10 lost tribes are going to come and rescue Jews, but rather people from the actual sovereign state of Israel are coming. Um, and this really um, enables Jews to move, to, to really move differently in the world. Even, and, and here I think it's interesting because we get so tangled in a question of is there theological significance to the state of Israel, we tend to get to this binary of either it's Rashid Smicha Latenu, and then yes, it does. Or you no, know, it's not necessarily Beishit Smichai Latino, and then where are you left? Um, and it seems to me that there's another dimension to this, which is whether or not we stand at the inception of a messianic age. And I hope that we will, that we do, but I actually have no idea. The very fact that Jewish sovereignty exists in the land of Israel, the fact now, I mean, the, it, the situation is completely turned on its head. Now you have people who want to better their own circumstance. I mean, this is one reading, right? But if people want to better their circumstances in the world, but getting entry into the state of Israel is a way to improve your lot in the world. As a medievalist, this is mind-boggling. You know, Jew in the Middle Ages would have imagined that, that by being acknowledged as a Jew, your status would go up. Um, and, so now, and so now you have Israeli organizations that are seeking people like the B'nai Menashe. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, as a historian, I'm more persuaded by the position of Rabbi Akiva that the tribes are gone, they're not coming back. Um, and so fascinating to think about the role that the quest for the 10 lost tribes plays in the Jewish imagination today, but it's a totally different role. But right? here the idea is that the 10, is Kibbutz Galil, right? We are living on the cusp of the Messianic age. Part of that prophecy is the ingathering of the exiles as part of the ingathering of the exiles. Or there's also, for the political reasons, to have more Jews in the land of Israel, in the state of Israel. But we live in a completely different circumstance. I'm thinking about the medieval and early modern quest, the fantastical quest for sovereignty, I think, gives us a new way to appreciate um, what is really uh, a gift of the Rebona Shalom that we have the state of Israel, that we have Jewish sovereignty in the world. So I would wonder if the if um, if if the Bene Levi are missing. That would be my first thought. Because right, because um, but other than that, no, that that, 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 would, that would be my only thought on, on that. So I thought um, that uh, I think we can there's an article about the Pashtun tribes in Afghanistan who they they make up the Taliban. And they seem to have all the customs, what they call the um, customs. And there's some supposition that they are descended from the lost tribes. Okay. 
<laughs> so I there uh, there are um, so there there have long been um, legends that the Pashtun are are part of the Tomas tribes. Um, I I am persuaded that the, t the ten tribes have as assimilated into the world that they were taken to, which is what you I mean the fact that Jews didn't is the anomaly. Um, and so I, I think this quest for the 10 lost tribes tell, even today tells us more about the people who are looking than it does about anything um, about that. Karen said, I had a student um, write about the, uh, the Beta Israel and he found a source. I, I, did, I haven't seen it with my own eyes. So I'll say only that I have the second hand, but apparently there was some professor, genetics professor of Ari Lam and some Ethiopian students said, we want you to do genetic testing on us and, and like, we'll prove that we're Jewish. Whole question, what, what does genetic testing means altogether? A big question in, a, in our world in general, what is this coming to mean? Um, and when he got the results, um, the professor didn't want to share them because it wasn't really the result that everybody was looking for. Um, and so, so I, I am not, I, I am not, pers I'm persuaded that this is more about the people who are looking and sort of what all of this means today than it is about actual just genetic descent. The ten tribes, like you're saying, is the ten tribes are gone. Oh, I'm not saying the Gemara is saying that. Yeah. I'm not saying that. So then, what, what about? Um, I know my husband's grandfather and grandmother traveled the world many, many times uh, during the 1900s, and they sought out and found small tribes within Africa, within all parts of the world. That were that were Jewish. That, that seemed to be doing all of the Jewish things. They had their Torah. They had their practice. They had the rabbi. So what, one fun? complicating factor is that in the 16th century you have a lot of Protestant missionizing, and some of this is very biblicizing Protestant missionizing, right? So people who to adopt a Protestant, you know, a Protestant group. Or people who are interested by influenced by Protestant Christians who read the Bible and say, "Let's follow biblical practices," right? Because the Torah is a sacred text for Christians as well. That's going to look very similar to right. We're going to say, "Oh, they don't eat pork, and they don't, you know, they do this, and they rest on the seventh day." That's going to look similar to Jew to Jewish practices, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going on. Very fascinated by the by the verbiage that the Rabbi Yosef has used here, especially when he's referring at the end of the first line. Those from Abayim Eretz Kush, the infant Shevet Dan, he says, "Bleed something," and it's as if he is transforming the legend of El Dan into a sorrow. So here he's just sort of quoting the Rabbi. Right, and the Rabbah yeah, yeah. has right, done so, that. Right. Yes, and he so, is accepting that transformation. Right? right, so this is right. So this is the question. Right, you know, halacha yeah. and history. Right, how, you know, how do they talk to each other? You know, as on some level, the Rabbah has given authenticity to this idea. Right. But as a historian, hard for me to to so, swallow the historical accuracy. Right. So that, I, and, I mean, and, that's, yeah. that's the real question because you know, there's no, for instance, uh, geologic proof of this among uh, you know existing. And yet it appears to be like one of those legends that appears in so many different uh, cultural contexts, almost like a flood story that, that, that occurs in more than just uh, say for gracious, right? That there are many other cultures that claim that you know, the world underwent the enormous flood. And I'm, and I'm wondering how, how those ideas connect to lead to that there is at least something this is right. right. So, so, so he's and this is, you know, when, when he when he passed away some number of years ago, they came up with these top ten lists, and the his decision about the only Ethiopia was, you know, on that top ten list. And, and Rabbi Mario Yosef can, can do things by virtue of his uh, by virtue of his, his authority, um, you know, by by fiat on some level. He's one of the very you know very few rabbis in the world who can. But what's fascinating to me is that the Beta Israel's origin story has shifted over time. That is the story that they used to tell was that they were the descendants of the union between um, King Shlomo and Malkat Shiva. And then, right, when it becomes, and then when it becomes clear that, that 
the, uh, being accepted, the, the, the story that the rest of Jews tell about them is that they are descendants of Shiva Don. Like that's their, that's that story, that story shifts. So, so origin, origin stories, right, are, are, everything is in conversation with, with everything else. Also, the context of, of that sack was, it was great, there's a tremendous amount of tension in Israel about whether they required Gior and the Sephay, whether they required, you know, mass conversion. Um, it was a very, a very, um, what was it, incendiary um, situation in Israel. And, it is kind of amazing that Badi Yosef I mean, took a very definitive stance on that. Yeah. And you know, it flared up very recently, if I remember correctly, it was in the news a couple of years ago, because one of the Haredi mashkichem of one of the Israeli wine, you know, wine companies said, I can't right. give, I can't give hashgacha to this wine um, if the people, because the people who are working on it are beta, or, you know, people from, uh, were from Beta Israel, and they haven't converted, and so they're they're not technically Jewish. And, and there was all these cries of racism, and I thought to myself, you know, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, right? This the assertion the assertion that these people are, you know, Chachal Avadi Yosef really came down hard in favor of one position, but it's not the only position that you could imagine someone taking. You know, I, I don't know that we need to say that it's racism that, that leads to this position, and the Ethiopian Jewish community, the Beta Israel very much um, was very offended at the, at the idea that they undergo conversion, even, you know, even for some kind of ceremonial purpose or outside or something like that. Like to say to somebody, you have to convert just in case is, is super challenging. Yeah, Wasn't that the same Are you thinking about the Bene Menashe? Maybe so, I don't know. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, is mass conversion only because of origin stories or is it because of, of, of the conversion? So, I mean, I think, I think, I think the part of the question is, is do rabbinic authorities buy into the idea that these are people who are Jewish, who have maintained their Jewishness? And sometimes, and sometimes I think you're pointing to something important, which is that sometimes, in terms of how things play out in the real world, um, a decision that somebody is not Jewish and needs to undergo conversion actually leads to a better outcome than a decision that someone is Jewish. Because for example, you have the Karaite community, which is caught in this limbo and the Israeli government doesn't, doesn't, call it, doesn't characterize them as Jews, but it also doesn't characterize them as non-Jews. And they can't marry rabbinic Jews because their laws of marriage and divorce are different. So they're so that they, they, they can't move, right? They can't convert to rabbinic Judaism either. So in some ways, saying that they're non-Jewish creates an easier entry once you can get, get over the fact of having to convert. I'm wondering if you could just uh, talk to us for a second about how it is right now. And I'm curious if that's The Catholic Church has undergone, at least at its highest echelons, you know, in terms of post-Vatican II theology, has undergone an incredible shift, right? The discourse in the Middle Ages is that you have um, this um, supersessionist thought that says that Christianity has replaced Judaism, that Jews were once the chosen people, but now Christians are the chosen people. They are the bearers of the new covenant. And if this idea, if the supersessionist ideology is too complicated for the average person in the Middle Ages to understand, you can see statues at the Cathedral of Notre Dame or at Strasbourg, where you have these images of two women, Ecclesia representing the church, standing tall, straight with her crown on her staff. She has her chalice. And there's synagogue who's downcast and she has a blindfold over her eyes. And sometimes she has the tablets of the law fallen at her feet, right? Um, and, and these are the, the images of Judaism and Christianity. Um, whereas in the wake of Vatican II, there is a sense, sensibility that God has, you know, has God only one blessing? And the answer is no. Um, and so you even have revisions of these images so 
um, some, you know, one Catholic theologian has created images of Ecclesia and Synagoga, sort of post-Vatican II standing side by side by one another. Um, so you see, I believe at St. Joseph's University at the 50th anniversary of Vatican II, they, they had a new statue of Ecclesia and Synagoga um, commemorate, you know, drawn where they're sitting side by side and they're looking over at each other's texts. Um, and on some level, like Christianity needs Judaism and is interested in Jews, as Professor David Brueggemann said, what Jews really want from Christians is, will you please leave us alone? Uh, you know, so, so they, you know, the, the, the level of interest is not necessarily mutual. Christians want to understand Judaism because the Jewish Torah is part of Christianity. Jews don't really need um, Christianity. So that's shifted. And, and within the last couple of years, Pope Francis sent out an encyclical that talked about rabbinic Judaism and Christianity as being two alternate religious responses to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. So, you know, as a Jewish historian, I would argue that rabbinic Judaism has roots that are earlier than the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, but for a, a Christian theologian to be talking in those terms is incredibly revolutionary. Um, and I think that when the, today, when the Catholic Church and the Vatican have issues with the state of Israel, um, it is the same thing that bothers everybody else about the state of Israel, which is which is the issue of Palestinians and, and treatment of Palestinians. But it, it's uh, at least at the highest echelons. But of course, there are uh, more conservative Christians. Like if you remember uh, Mel Gibson's film, the passion, the passion, the passion, passion, the passion of Christ, whatever it was, right? That reflected an older Christian way of thinking that is still um, prevalent in some groups within the church that reject that. So Isaac, you'll stop us when you're done. So if you're talking about the, uh, the quote that you're making in the how does that impact Protestant Christianity in those settings that you that the latest in Um it doesn't affect Protestant Christianity. So how does can you talk about how Protestant Judaism Um so here I am arguing that um less on terra firma and here I think there is a certain amount of disagreement. Um, the Catholic Church has disavowed missionizing and proselytizing to Jews, right? Think about that. The Catholic Church has disavowed proselytizing to Jews because Jews have a path to God on their own. Now, Christians are encouraged, Catholics are encouraged and permitted to witness to Jews. What is the difference between proselytizing and witnessing in practice? I'm not exactly sure, but theologically speaking, that is a significant step forward. Um, some Protestant um, denominations have reaffirmed their commitment to proselytizing to Jews. So when the Southern Baptist Convention in the 90s reaffirmed that it was going to proselytize to Jews, that caused a tremendous amount of upheaval, you know, and got a very negative reaction from, um, from Jew, not so much Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews kind of ignored it. But, um, but the reform and conservative and American Jewish establishment found this very, very threatening, right? The idea that, that the Southern Baptist um, Convention was reaffirming its commitment to trying to convert Jews to Christianity. Um, and evangelical Christians who are Protestants are among the most ardent supporters of the state of Israel um, in the United States. Um, when politicians pander to those who want to support Israel, we're, we're not that numerous to matter to them. And New York and New Jersey, where the, I mean, you guys actually, your votes matter. Um, my vote doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and your votes don't, don't matter. Um, you know, state, you have power. But um, it's, not, it's not the Jewish vote that they're after, it's the evangelical vote. And there are different opinions in the Jewish community that by risk of or Torah Stone, says, you know, no, they've moved beyond this idea that the reason that we want to bring Jews to the state of Israel is not so that they can, they can all be there together at the time of the eschaton and either convert to Christianity or be destroyed, but rather, we want, you know, they want to see the flourishing of Jewish life in the state of Israel. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical about that. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm a medievalist. I think that the idea that, you know, that you would have Christian volunteers coming to work on Jew, you know, Jewish um, farms, raising, helping them make wine of all things. Um, to, to me as a medievalist, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well. And I personally would say, on the one hand, you know, th thank you, but 
no thank you. On the other hand, um, evangelical Christian support is a very significant um, political factor in, in the United States. My dad and I disagree about this. My father says, so what if they say that? Let's, you know, let's take their help and we'll see what happens at the end of days. You know, we'll see who's right. And um, Nefesh for Nefesh, which is the organization that had made it so much easier for, for North American Jews to immigrate to Israel, was founded with evangelical Christian support. So how you, what, what you see is the theological underpinning of that support. I think it depends on, depends on, depends first of all on which Jew you're talking to and probably also which evangelical Christian you're talking to. Thank you so much. This was really enlightening and fascinating. And um, thank you and, and your husband for giving us really a, an elevated weekend of, of wonderful uh, Torah and thoughtful uh, insights. We really appreciate it. It was really a, a pleasure to be here.